Hello and welcome to the Larger Than Necessary First Player Token Podcast. My name is Chris. I'm David. I'm Pavel. And this is episode 108. Wow. Hooray! I did that in a different order this time. I got slightly confused, but <laughs> then again, no more than usual. I pressed the record button, I don't think I was quite ready. <laughs> it's like, nah, we're doing it. Okay, this is going to be a video games episode this week. Yep. Wow. Are we ready? Are we ready? Are you ready, Pavel? Uh, you know what? I've been. Yeah. I've seen. I've seen our Twitter feed. I've seen what you've been posting on it, and I know that you are very, very, very excited about the game that you want to talk about. I've, I've played a few things, and then I just dropped them when I started playing a thing, and I can't <laughs> play anything else. I just need to play that thing. <laughs> okay, that's Sunless Skies, but we're going to talk about that later because w- first up, we are going to talk about the hotness, the current hotness, which Ooh. is Resident Evil Two. Ooh. Never thought I'd say that in 2019, but there we go. Yeah, the, the hot game from 1998. <laughs> well done, Capcom. Yeah. Well, Dave, you've been playing this. You've, you've yes. been streaming this as I, well. I, I streamed a little bit. Uh, I have been playing this. Pavel has been playing it as well. If you've been following our Twitter feed, you will know that Pavel has been playing it. Uh, <laughs> you might not be aware that I've been playing it because I don't just post random guff onto Onto the feed. <laughs> yeah, Pavel's got that bit covered. <laughs> but yeah, it's the the remake of the very very popular game Survival Horror from uh, yeah 1998. As I said, it's uh, Resident Evil is the <clears throat> is the franchise that basically coined the term, I believe, Survival Horror. Although there were games before it that that kind of started up that genre alone in the dark is sort of rec- regarded as one of the uh the progenitors of the the oh, genre i would say that stirs some memories man alone in the dark beautiful mm. and there were a number of other games that sort of came along after that but nothing really rivaled resident evil apart from maybe silent hill yeah well silent hill came a little later but yeah resident evil took it in a slightly different direction didn't it because it made it th- those older games were they still had elements of point and click adventures almost in their feel, mm. just with added threat. <laughs> but uh, Resident Evil brought a more kind of action focus yeah. to it, although it doesn't it doesn't seem super action oriented. It's still like, a puzzle to, game, but uh, it still yeah. retains the puzzle elements. But uh, yeah, so finally, I mean, there have been there was a Resident Evil to re-release on the GameCube, I think. But it was just, it was the game as it was, kind of upscaled a bit, I think. And not much, I think. I mean, it was maybe just polygon count. Yeah, it didn't look much different. (laughs) So people people were a bit disappointed at the time. And because, I think it's fair to say this was the most popular one out of the franchise. I mean, until you get to Resident Evil 4, I guess, of the sort of... Which was the newer era. Yeah. Uh, This was the one that people really loved... That people, it was much anticipated for whatever reason. I don't know why. It was hugely hyped. Uh, I, I, actually, I remember being very excited about this game coming out, and it got delayed. And uh, they brought out the director's cut of the first Resident Evil to kind of fill the gap. Uh, and it was like a day one purchase for so many people. I remember I bought it. Lots of my friends bought it, and we all rushed home excitedly to to play this new thing um, I, I wasn't even aware of the drama i just picked it up and and, and enjoyed it back in. yeah and i really liked resident evil 4 but it was uh, a much sort of newer game in terms of concept and, and, and gameplay compared to the remake yeah as in remake of resident yeah evil because it, it took the game in a different direction and a different feel uh there were certain things that resident evil the franchise were was known for uh, at the time, that kind of things things that it innovated in, perhaps like the fact that there were zombies in it. Now, back then, that was not like oh god, not more zombies. Back then, it was like oh cool, these <laughs> there's zombies in this game, <laughs> and they're really different because they're like they're really slow, but they take lots of bullets to knock down, and like they slowly shamble towards you, and so they're not immediately threatening. But if you let them get too close to you, then they are, and you can dodge them. And, like now, now that seems like so passe, uh. Uh, but at the time it was like it was great and it was like violent and bloody and visceral and you could like there was like blood splatters and bits of them would 
uh, come off the zombies and they would crawl along the floor and stuff that is so standard now. Yeah, but at the time we were like, "Wow, check this out! Look at this! It's amazing!" And the guy with the big William Birkin, with the, that thing with the eyeball in his arm. Oh, the the boss thingy. Yeah, it has these weird, like mutated looking enemies as well. In addition to the zombies. Oh was, yeah, Resident Evil's got all sorts of yeah, monstrosities. It's like they're they're crazy. So it wasn't just zombies, but there was other things like the the choice of characters. This was an interesting thing at the time. Wasn't it? You got to choose between... In Resident Evil 2, it was like Leon and Claire. And I suppose the novelty there was that the story Sintar linked. To it was. Modern, yeah. You played the game and you saw it. You'd play through as whichever character you chose to go as first. And you get to the end and, you, spoiler alert, you fight the last boss uh, and win. And, <laughs> no. and then you play again. Does that count as a spoiler? <laughs> You play again as the, their uh, compa- compatriot. And it's exactly as Pavel says, the stories interlink. So sometimes some of the things you saw the first time around, like you'd go into a location and you'd be like, well, what the hell happened here? And then you'd play through as the second player and you'd be like, ah, oh, okay, now I see this is what happens. <laughs> because they're in the same location and they would meet up periodically for a little chat on the other usually like between through like a chain link fence or like some other so So refresh my memory in the original was it also just conversations and nothing else or were they actually like unlocking things that others couldn't unlock so that in the different gameplay you could then access this area and stuff like this it's basically the first thing there was a tiny bit of interaction they made quite a lot of the fact that you were playing as these two players and but basically, if you played through as Leon, you could pick up all the ammo and all the herbs to heal you because they weren't going to be there for Claire anyway when she played through. There was one or two things that you could leave behind for the second player. There was an ammo, like an extended inventory thing, and I think a machine gun as well. Huh. Uh, that was it. So it was really more about the the interweaving of their two their two stories and seeing these two these two stories interlocked and then explained as you played through the game. Uh, and the other thing it had was challenge playthroughs. This was a big thing, because it's a relatively short game to play through once you know how to, where everything is. But what you could do was the game rated you, uh, give you a rank in Japanese style from C <laughs> through to S. Nah, and S. it was dependent on how many times you saved, how long you took, whether you used the first aid sprays and various other things. So you could do your challenge playthroughs where you would try to get a better rank and this would unlock uh, unlimited ammo weapons, so like the rocket launcher and, and so on. And famously if you could play, the most difficult one was to play through, finish it in under two hours, one half of the game one, one half playthrough, in under two hours uh, no dying, no saving uh, basically in one sitting. Oof. So that was like a but that was a, the thing was, it was a challenge you could do like mm. Like, you didn't have to be a super hardcore gamer. If you knew this game well enough, uh, you could do it. And all of this stuff, I would say, is in the new game. All of that carries over. Uh, And it's really what they've added is a slight modernization. Like, by, by today's standards, it's pretty normal. It looks very pretty. Uh, but yeah, yeah, the graphics are still good. The uh, All the stuff with the character choices and so on are still there. Uh, and what they've kind of interestingly done is it's not a remake like for like, though, is it? It's a kind of remix. Remix is actually a very nice... I like this word, oh, remix. Good term, Dave. It comes yeah, straight from, from the Soundsters uh, <laughs> vocabulary. Well, it is, though, because you see the same things, but they're different. And so it's some, it plays with your expectations. The orders of things that take place, uh-huh. they're like mixed up. You go into a room that you remember from playing the game the first time around, uh, and you're like, oh, I wonder if the thing that I remember happening will happen. And typically it doesn't. But something similar or the same things come in, they just come in at a different time. So all the, all the stuff is still there. And obviously they've built on on top of it simple things, but in my opinion, adding quite a lot of values, even 
stuff like you founding I, I i don't remember in the original resident evil 2 you finding like uh, planks that you could use to barricade windows no but what you could do was there was a section where you could put down the shutters so i remember because i played mm. this game so much so there was a back corridor where you could choose if you wish to put down the shutters mm. and actually this this was one of the other things that you could choose to do in one playthrough or the second mm-hmm. uh and that would prevent zombies getting through the windows so it was mm. a sort of strategic choice if you like i mean there wasn't a lot of that but yeah they built on that instead of just having exactly that thing as before which they could have done they've instead had this thing where you find wooden planks and you can board up windows and you have to decide to an extent it depends on what difficulty you play on which windows you're going to board up whether you're going to even bother boarding up the windows or whether you're just going to give it a miss uh just board, board the windows. Spoiler yeah, alert. If you're playing, yeah, it is a bit of a spoiler. But if you're playing on standard, yeah, just board up the windows. Don't worry about it because you get loads of planks. <laughs> now, I played on standard and I've boarded maybe one window. The reason being, I like to hoard stuff when I play horror, um, horror survival <laughs> games. And I'm like, I'm going to find use for those later. I am nearly done with the game. I've just reached the, what I think is the final sort of area. And I still have five, at least five units of, of that in my inventory. Of planks. Yeah. Yeah, it's a big problem with this game is that you don't really, you don't really know how to budget your resources. And it was a flaw in the original. At the time, it was considered a, a good thing. It was like, oh, you've have, you've got limited bullets, are you going to use them? Yeah, uh, but, but is it a flaw, though? Because I actually yes. think that there is a bit of a <laughs> novelty or, or reminded novelty in the fact that the game doesn't tell you what to do when. No, you it's keep rubbish. guessing. It's terrible. I, I, it's like, <laughs> this, game is, this game is not a very good game. I, sh- I mean... I would say people have been reviewing it very well and I can understand why. If you haven't played Resident Evil 2, you're going to miss a huge amount of the value of this game. Uh, The gameplay part of it is not brilliant. It's not horrible. It's not awful. It's amazing. It's It's kind of in the middle. It's just what Dave says is not true. And it's full of design flaws that are there because it is beholden to the previous games. So you can kind of let it off for that because it is part of being Resident Evil 2. And it wouldn't be Resident Evil 2 without spade keys and phoenix crests and a whole array of cranks, levers, That's the gears. puzzle That's oh, the... These are not puzzles, pal. It's like you just run around <laughs> and it's like, oh, I found this. I, I know I need to use this. I just You run around in circles picking these things up. Eventually you'll come across the place where you use it. I was so That's terrified this, this playing this game that when whenever I actually found something and I thought, you know what, I'll need it later, I don't need it now, what I can do now is backtrack to the to the bank sort of chest thingy, uh, that, that, that inventory space where you can deposit your stuff so that you don't have to carry it with you. And if you find another chest like this in a different area of the game, all your stuff will be there, yeah? So... All the backtracking, which I imagine some people might find um, annoying or boring, for me it was therapeutic. I was I was I was returning back to what I considered safe areas. I felt so relaxed when I was doing this. It was peaceful and uh, just just added to uh, to the dynamics of the game. Whenever I ventured out exploring new areas, it was like proper survival horror, and then coming back was just pleasant. Putting things in chests is not not what, 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 what Dave considers pleasant. <laughs> Chris has seen me play this, so yep. he knows what I'm talking about. Dave has a specific whether, relationship whether or with not, chests. Whether or not to put something in a chest or carry it in your inventory is not good. a good game experience. This is not an exciting decision that I wish to make. It's like, should I carry the massive crank with me i don't know if i'm going to need it i might need it but i might not i might not need that for another two hours oh what an exciting dilemma no it's bullshit no. and there's no way that should be in the game it's just the gameplay and this game is full of bullshit stuff and the number one thing is of course mr x what's the wrong worst with mr. X? the absolute worst is the absolute pits uh, he's I, amazing he's not amazing 
<laughs> Mr. X was he's a, he's a tyrant in in the original Resident Evil Two. He would he's like this basically indestructible virtually guy who would turn up at prescripted points. He'd like smash through a wall, and the first time it happened, you're like oh, and then the second time you're like oh, well, I'm ready for this, and you would run away from him, from him, go through a door, and then he was gone until the next prescripted point when he would appear, and. In 1998, that was pretty cool. That was quite exciting. Uh, they don't want to do that now. That's So what they've done is they've made him a persistent character in the game. And it's awful. No, it's not. It's fantastic. No. So when I first encountered him, I just hid in a, in a um, typewriter room. I can't remember which one of us was. Yep. And, and just stayed exact- that. I did exactly I the same thing. I kept listening to his footsteps thinking, oh my god, whether, is he going to walk in here or not? I actually don't know, because the game doesn't tell you these things. And then you can hear this sound of doors opening, probably in the distance, although it sounds like it's quite close to you. And I was just so frightened uh, and impressed at the same time. In theory, it's really cool. Uh, but in practice, in practice, it was In practice, well. it's not, because he's just, an, he's just a freaking irritation. He's not actually a threat to you. He's just an annoyance because he just wanders around the mansion, the police station that you're in. I mean, it is cool. He wanders around somewhat randomly and he doesn't go away until it's the time in the game for him to go away. And then obviously he's going to come back at a later point and all the rest of it. This is all to be expected. Terrifying. But basically he's there while you are trying to play the game and he's just there to annoy you. So you're like, oh, I'm in a new, I'm in a new location. Maybe it would be look at all this beautiful uh, world building and design they've put into it. Oh no, I can't because there's this fanny who's <laughs> suddenly burst into the room and is trying to punch me in the fucking face. So I have to run around in circles like freaking Benny Hill, you- round and round the table. <laughs> this is what happened. I went into a room and it's like I'm in a new room. <laughs> This game shows you on the map whether you have picked up all the items in the room. Which is actually pretty cool. It is pretty cool. And what I did is I ran round and round a table looking for all the items in the room until the colour had changed on the map, <laughs> being chased by this idiot in a trench coat. I remember I've done this in the in the room with the with the lockers. Um... Yeah. I mean, if, if, why? Why would... There's no tension. It's just... You can run away and, like... Fine, and then he'll go wander off somewhere else, and then you can come back and like. So in the original game, right? Because I've never played, I've never played it. Yeah, Shame any of the original you, Resident Evils up until about maybe four or five. I can't remember. Yeah. Um, and I didn't really find four or five, whichever ones it was I played. I think it might have been those two to be particularly great. They were kind of like almost horde zombies at that point, weren't they? Uh, Come on, four yeah, bit diff- legendary. Bit, bit different, yeah. Aye, it was. It was kind of they dropped that sort of tension horror style thing, hadn't they? A bit. I don't know. Four seemed very. Close Maybe it was five. I played then. Five, yeah, five, 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 five. I played through with, uh, yeah. with with a friend who sure. insisted that I play it. Ah, uh, yeah, that was um, fine. Then, if I played seven, though. So seven was one of the best gaming experiences I've ever had seven, because I played it in goes, VR. Goes a yeah. little bit back to more of the original with keys and stuff. <laughs> so, um, try to think what my question was now. In the original Resident Evil Two, did you have just like as much time as you wanted to then explore these rooms, other than the other? crappy zombies that yeah. are wandering about so you could basically just take your time with yep it. you could take as long as you want once you dealt if you dealt with the enemies and normally you could do because unless you're doing a speed run then you can and so the first time you play through the game you get all the time in the world to like look at your surroundings read all the little booklets have a think about what's going on where you're going to go next uh and just absorb the the atmosphere and but then, you're supposed to be absorbing the atmosphere whilst listening to the heavy footsteps of Mr. X. If it was just his heavy footsteps off in the distance, that would be fine. And that's not the problem. The problem is when he comes into the room that you're in, and uh-huh. you're then forced to run round in circles. <laughs> I mean, I, I get the impression they've added this in to just try and add that extra bit of tension into it, but it seems like it's, it's not worked for you, for Pavel. Pavel's just well excited about it. I, I, I worked fantastically. I felt that this was a brilliant addition to the game. Uh, the, the, the whole puzzle design of the game is there to essentially force you to return to various rooms. And because half of those enemies don't seem fully killable, that adds to the, the, the survival horror design where 
your inventory management and the amount of ammunition you use up is probably more important than anything else or your healing items for that matter. Um, so it's semi sort of strategic choices. When and where are you going to go and how often? Uh, so all the, all the zombies potentially regenerating or just uh, crawling through windows again and Mr. X on top of it were simply just additional factors in, the, in this entire sort of labyrinth of you deciding which particular item has suddenly unlocked you a different area where you can pick up another item which you can then use you know in the area three areas ago that's this is it's it's an integral part of the design and i think it works really well and dave is incorrect <laughs> so they kind of had that in resident evil 7 did you play resident evil 7 either of you no, that's the that's the first person perspective one. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, first person first person perspective is wrong and shouldn't exist. But you see, it, it works really well in VR, obviously. Okay. Now, and one of the that things, makes sense, actually, one yeah. of the, it it, it 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 was a bit like that in that game. There was like a lot of sections where you were just kind of running back and forward. But a lot of the things in that, I think, if they had something like Mister X in that, it would have been bullshit. Okay, I think that that would have just made the whole VR thing just annoying if you were just constantly having to run away. Because the whole tension in Resident Evil 7 when you were playing it in VR was the idea that you had no idea what was around the next corner. You Even in places that you'd already been, sometimes things would appear. And when you're playing in VR and it seems a bit more real, like, that is terrifying. Uh, it and was that's, supposedly... that was the beauty of yeah. the game. And there were jump scares in Resident Evil 7, but they didn't overdo it. Hmm. I think there was maybe, like, three if that, in the entire game, where it was just like a case of somebody burst out in front of you. Oh, that's that's less than I thought. I thought this game was actually quite sort of based on jump scares. No, no, I think people made that assumption, though. All right. I mean, there was a lot of bits where, like, you felt like there was going to be jump scares, uh-huh. but they didn't do it. But they were kind of like, I almost felt like that was deliberate. It was almost like you were saying, like, you're you're about to walk up a flight of stairs or something like that. You're like, something's going to jump out when I get up to the top of this yeah. flight of stairs. I can, I can tell. And you, So you slowly creep up there. And in VR, your heart's racing because it's right in your face. You can't get away from it. Yeah. Like, <laughs> so you're walking upstairs and then nothing happens, and you're just kind of like, "Oh, right." <laughs> so what's through the door? <laughs> you know. Like, how many how many people have rage quit this game by essentially just smashing their helmet on the wall? <laughs> well, you mean just by being terrified rather yeah, than rage yeah, quit? Yeah. Well, probably quite a few. Huh. I put I, I put the, I put it on my my mate who had played through Resident Evil Seven, uh, non VR. So he knew what to expect. Yeah, but I put him into the game in a sort of random point in the game. It was just a random save I had. Uh-huh. And uh, I put it on. It was like it was down in the basement of the house or something like that. I remember him just being like, I don't like it. <laughs> I don't like it. Take it off. I don't like it. <laughs> like, it hadn't even moved. He just looked around for a bit and he went, no. <laughs> See, I've, I've watched a few horrors in a, in a cinema where I, where I had to shut my eyes because I was just not enjoying the intensity of horror. Uh, and you know you can't just look away when you're in the cinema because there's nothing else to look at. So I would just shut my eyes. So VR is probably not for me <laughs> either. <laughs> but here is a question, Dave, because you would know that. Um, hopefully, um, I've because uh, again, this is not something the game really tells you, and I've not read that much about it. Uh, I know that if I shoot a zombie with 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 a flame sort of bullet from my from my grenade launcher, it it doesn't stand back up. If you know what mm. I mean. But if I if I actually fall if I fell a zombie with with bullets to the head, and then it just sort of stands back up, and I fell it again with bullets to the head, is there a point where where some of them will just keep standing up forever? Uh, I'm not 100 percent sure on the answer to that question. And but I the um, yeah. they do they do tend to go down the second time but i don't know if that's a hard and fast rule uh, generally it's consistently you, sh- you knock down a zombie it will get back up again if you just shoot it with your gun uh, i don't actually know because I, I don't mind that so much but i like the fact that you don't know i like i, I yeah. actually quite like the fact that this game does not tell you as much as you used to be told and you shoot them. You know what? For half the game, because um, again, I'm, I'm nearly done, and I would have probably finished this game by now if I've not discovered something else, uh, which I tend to do. Um, for half the game, I was quite convinced that most zombies in this game are actually unkillable. That you only the, the only thing you can do if you're forced to is fell them, 
for a short while so that you can pass through a particularly narrow place. But other than that, you can and should expect them to stand back up. So I never even attempted to, you know, just kill them with a gun. No, there is a there is a consistent down state. But again, it's like you don't really know. And this idea that you have a fixed amount of ammo, but there's no real way to know how much of it you should use or how you should budget it until you play through the entire game. And again, it's a by today's standard is an awful and unacceptable design decision. And also <laughs> such an exciting thing. It's not exciting, but uh, <laughs> it's like, oh, I've used up all my ammo. Was that too much? Maybe. Who knows? I'll just have to keep continuing the game. No, Maybe but, I'll get to a bit where I just don't have any ammo and I can't get any further. That'll the, be fun. That's that's, <laughs> the, that's the tension that you're going How much ammo the... have you got left? I bet you've got fucking loads. <laughs> I bet your chest is rammed with healing items and ammo because you're like, oh, I don't know if I could use well, it. Like, well, well, what's the point but, of that? You'll get to the end of the game and you'll be like, oh, I've got a bazillion healing items. Well, uh, I have quite a lot of healing <laughs> items. I don't have that much ammo left, unfortunately, even though it was only one stage where I've suddenly started using it up a lot because I was absolutely terrified of the of the sewer monsters just uh, oh yeah the the sewer monsters where you get one of them and he pops out the water and you're like well should i attack this sewer monster or should i run past him i have no way of knowing well guess what you should run past him because if you kill the first one there's another one and then another one and then another one after that but and the only way you find that out is by going through it going oh i either got it right or wrong i can continue with the game or i can go back to my previous save well, that's the beauty of survival horrors that you don't know. You have to presume and act upon hey, your perception. Maybe you should stop playing this game, Dave. No, I must say once you once you know <laughs> once you know all this stuff, and the first one was like this too. It's like, like replaying it will be quite enjoyable. And doing you can do the challenge runs on this one exactly the same. And there's the hardcore mode as well, which is going to involve a lot of running around, unfortunately, and dodging zombies, which like gameplay. It's going to involve gameplay. Well, it's going to involve not killing the zombies yeah. because you don't have enough ammo. And But there is a strategic element to it because once you know... Which you, ones not to kill. And yeah, once you know how much you're going to get and where all the items are, you can think, well, this is the bit I'm going to do. There's bits that you can skip. Am I going to bother going to this area? Is it worth it? You can make these kind of decisions. Either you can read a guide, which some people will do. and make, no. Well, some people enjoy doing it that way. Or you can sit and do it yourself and it is doable. So then it's fun you you even even sort of keep an inventory of which zombies are still not defeated and your head is part of this game i mean even now i know that there's still one zombie next to the library and two and the uh in one of the rooms two policemen you know it's just it's just something you know to expect and that's this game is is, is all about it i think yeah well i mean all these complaints they're very resident evil it was never a it was never a perfect game, even at the time, and they very faithfully recreated, recreated the experience. I would say, for good and for bad. See, I only have one complaint about this game. When you when you start it, it doesn't say Resident Evil. Yeah, because it should, and it used to, and I don't accept that. That's um, my only complaint. Oh well, uh, sell your copy. I mean, I'm in completely no, agreement I can with Pavel on this. On this I, point. I can still play it without it. Well, but... okay. Well, can we can we end on that that note then? If Dave actually agrees with something yep. that you've said, Pavel, we have to, well, we need to end on that note. I think. I'm only going to add that I'm. It's okay because I can say it myself when I start the game, and trust me, I am. I am saying. I can it. definitely picture you doing that. Very good. <laughs> okay, that is Resident Evil Two, the uh, remix. I believe we're calling it now. Yep. Um, that's by Capcom. Five out of ten. <laughs> I'm gonna say pretty much nine out of ten. Given me Resident Evil, you've got a tenner, and I very much enjoyed contradicting David every turn. I, you know what? It was, this was delightful. We yeah, should that do was, this more that, often. That, that was a good debate. I enjoyed that. <laughs> I enjoyed just sitting back in my chair there and watching you two go at that. I'm like, I was glad I didn't play that game actually. I'm, I'm glad Dave's not played Sunless Skies now. <laughs> well, let's move on to that then, Pavel. Tell us about Sunless Skies. <laughs> Hello. I'm not, uh, let's okay. So I'm gonna try and be brief because I've I've only played what I think is about ten hours of it, and and it's probably not even twenty five percent of the game yet. So I will have more to say about it. For now, <clears throat> I'm gonna try and find you a genre. Uh, it's potentially roguelite. If you choose to play it like this, you don't have to. 
Although I have a feeling that what's called merciful mode is actually uh, by design potentially even more dangerous depending on your choices. And I'll, 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 I'll mention why in a moment. So um, Sunless Skies is made by, um, uh, by the dev called Feel Better. Um, and I think it's a spiritual successor to uh, to a game called Sunless Seas, which I've not played, so I'm not <gasps> going to compare. I have. All right then. Oh, I talked cool. about it on the podcast. So you did. So I'm gonna I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna compare to what Chris said. <laughs> no, I'm not my memories. For what I remember about it, yes, you're right. It was a roguelite. It was quite story heavy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, it was very charming. It was very um, slightly terrifying at times. There you go. Um, but also, it was a really good game. Right. Well, you know what? So this is probably like that, maybe even better so. Again, difficult to say without playing the earlier one, although from what I gather from the reviews, it is built upon and expanded. Um, all the keywords you've used, I would definitely use, absolutely. Fail better, tend to make... So to sort of make make your adventure games, yeah, as in text text adventures, uh, and there's it's it's like quite text heavy or story heavy. Whenever you go, wherever you go, whatever you do in this game, there's gonna be a bit of narration and quite often uh, a choice to make. Um, but the, the the basic gameplay is. Um, uh, bird's view, as in top top down view of your ship, which is in fact a steam locomotive uh, flying through a sunless sky or space uh, amongst various floating islands and and what seems to be the ruins and remnants of the British Empire. Have a question? Yes. Uh, isn't space kind of full of suns? By, yeah, but by they're, they're in the distance, but your own is not there anymore. Oh. That's the thing. I so see. that's why Sunless, I'm assuming. Is it still kind of set in London area? Because Sunless Seas was definitely sort of London You start the game in the, in the area called The Reach, uh, which is a, a sort of a, a frontier uh, where London is still sort of trying to control and and sort of settlers are trying to break away right uh, but there is london i know i know exactly <laughs> still so there's, there's these two factions warring through at least this first area i've not even uh, left the reach and there are four areas in the game in total i believe now that the game has left the earlier release and one of those areas called albion is where london is i'll eventually get there um <clears throat> So just like you said, it's when you said it's slightly terrifying. Sunless Sky seems to have a lot of uh, this eldritch element to it, yeah. and it's very sort of metaphysical and 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 abstract even at times. Um, I mean, feel things may seem reasonably sort of steampunkishly normal uh, most of the time with your uh, with your captain and your crew members drinking tea and you know and and doing what Victorian people would do. And then from time to time, as you go through those stories, I don't know, uh, a, a person on uh, on the train platform will will see a particularly uh, attractive and, and like one, one of your crew members is, uh, is, a, is a princess in disguise, in fact. And she's so beautiful that the guy just spoons his eyes out. And you know what? And nobody even reacts to it. Like it's 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 normal. Uh, you, you know, mm. life goes on. And you, you as you go through this game, it's this bizarre feeling that this, none of those people are even alive. That you're possibly in some sort of purgatory or something because you get to meet the devils uh, who run a facility for you know polishing souls. You get to meet all sorts of strange creatures. This game is so amazingly written. Uh, I would love to just pick up an, a novel written by whoever came up with it and just go through that. It's uh, it's fantastic, um, and the amount of ideas they had. I mean, there's a there's a post on Twitter I've um, I've posted because I particularly liked it. I had no idea what this game was going to be, and and during the tutorial stage, you uh, you just uh, find. A bat and 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 a ruined locomotive, and suddenly you realize that the bat is hag- haggling with you for for pay. And from just a couple of sentences in that paragraph, you you have this 
just understanding what sort of character this this part's going to be. Uh, this game is the right level of absurd, I would say, and very dark as well. Oh, very interesting, claim. What what was that uh, RPG that we talked about quite some time ago, where Pavel was objecting quite strongly to the to the talking animals? See, the talking animals uh, in in a setting that tries to be uh, hard or realistic would annoy me, whereas Oh, Sunless, but because it's like this it's about otherworldliness. Uh, almost. Sunless Skies is immensely and very con- convincingly otherworldly. Um, right, but the the I I should probably mention yeah the the main gameplay is you are uh, cruising through through space and this just exploring these um, well. Some of the skies, yeah. Exploring what what is your first region and eventually other regions, um, with just your directional buttons and your mouse for for your. So what are you memory. actually exploring though? Is it planets? Is it? Uh, no, it's it's floating islands. Floating so islands, very, right? Very essentially rocky regions and and expanses with, uh, between them. Now the the sense of exploration in this game is absolutely. Uh, consuming i would say i've i've found myself quite obsessed by this game even when i'm not playing it and it doesn't happen often you know gaming is is, is a pastime you know you you have some time you're gonna play some games i don't pick up a game often where i'm actually at work or elsewhere and i'm thinking about what i'm gonna do when i return home where i'm gonna sail what i might encounter uh it's quite frightening. You you keep going through these unexplored areas, keeping an eye on your supplies and your fuel, um, and, and it can be dreadful at times because mm. those are actually quite long distances. But uh, those those are the best games. So if 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 a game's got you thinking about it when you're not playing it, then that's that's a good game for you. I mean, I, I do this with Seven Days to Die. Mm. Um, I'm on, I think I mention this game in every episode now. Um, it's fine. But, it's just part of who you are. But I, I sit and plan out base designs in my head while yeah. I'm working and stuff like that, and yeah. you know that just means that the game's got you gripped. Oh, absolutely. And and in this in this case, it's quite even. I would say like just you know intoxicating because once you start playing it, you just lose your grip with what you'd consider mundane reality because the the this twisted uh, otherworldly reality of of the setting. Uh, as you keep uncovering the layers of it and and going through what's absolutely just delicious level of of writing quality, every nugget of ideas the authors had is just brilliant, and I'm hungry for more all the time. So I just I just crave this game when I'm not bloody playing it. It's bloody feverish, but you know what? Amazing. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's there's plenty of combat which can be quite punishing if you do it incorrectly or if you're not prepared for it uh, with other local motives uh, either from warring factions or you know just pirates uh, shooting at your local motive and it's just physics based you know I mean somebody shoots a cannonball it's gonna fly towards you have time to dodge possibly or if your momentum uh, was to your advantage because you were just uh, you know f- flying in a particular direction it's going to be easier to dodge so, so so combat can be good or bad depending on your skill rather than on your loadout although loadout would obviously help you quite a lot um combat can scale up in difficulty uh depending on where you fly some of the uh eldritch creatures you meet can be just uh downright uh, murderous um so you want to be well prepared but even better prepared you want to be for the actual exploration part depending on what you do and where you find this game you may just end up end up losing simply because you've not prepared yourself for uh for a longer trip and and this is where the roguelite uh, aspect comes up because i think in this game when you pick the roguelite sort of mode uh your captain dies and you res- and, and then you sort of restart the game with mm. a new captain and either some either Either the world explored and you just continue your previous captain's uh, quest. I'm actually not sure because I've I've chosen the merciful um, part because it's still pretty hard to be fair. Uh, the merciful the merciful mode means that you uh, that the game saves auto saves whenever you're in in a port, but that also means 
the game is essentially constantly saving after every choice you make in a port, and quite a lot of this game's stories just take, in, take place in ports. Uh, but also, if you say if you if you visit a port uh, that doesn't stock fuel, for example, and you're al- already low on fuel, that's your save done. You have to depart and try to maybe sail back someplace where you could stock up on fuel. And if, if you're too far, that's you done because all you can do is reload back to the port where you already didn't have fuel. So merciful mode is really has its pitfalls as well if you if you. Um, make bad choices um and uh, yeah other than that uh, i'll have more to say about this game once i uh play another 10 or 20 hours of it uh (laughs) and you know what i'm looking forward to going back home now cool Uh, how much did this game cost you now you interest do you remember it's just like a week ago it it uh, came out of um uh, early release and i think it was like 12 or 15 pounds. Oh, that's great. So that's pretty reasonable. It's a reasonable place. The, the game has some bugs at the moment still. Not many. I've encountered uh, one bug so far and then another, um, which wasn't terribly game-breaking anyway, just an icon that popped up on my screen. I thought it just doesn't really look nice. It's just stuck there, so I switched off the game and switched it back on. Um, <clears throat> but other than that... Uh, it feels very well polished. The entire sort of locomotive navigation slash combat part feels uh, feels very well polished. All the pick your adventure stories are absolutely amazing, and obviously this game is all about um, the the third aspect of it that you always keep an eye on is uh, is trade because you have to try to keep money uh, to to make money in order to improve your locomotive and stuff like this. Um, and there's always going to be prospects and bargains to hunt, uh, depending on how how large your hold is, wherever you sail to, you know, to sell whatever you're you're holding. Um, so it's 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 a mixture of whatever is in your hold and and a huge amount of what a board player would say are tokens. In fact, because <laughs> even every conversation you make uh, can give you. I don't know, uh, a story you pick up is a, is a token. You can have 12 sky stories. Those are 12 tokens on your character. You can trade those tokens for something else. The game converts almost every occurrence uh, into some form of token and, and tracks it this way. So it's very, um, it's actually very well managed this way. It's very transparent. Right, sorry. Yes, more to come. Uh, absolutely frightening games at times. All right, cool. Thanks very much, Pavel. Uh, right, so that's Sunless Skies. It is listed as the sequel to Sunless Seas. I don't think it's actually a spiritual successor. Um, uh, difficult to say without playing, but uh, I understand that at some but point... But it sounds like they're different games because, well, obviously one's set in the sea and one's set in the, the sky. The but. game does say that that the English have left... Um, and right, so it's probably some set sometime in the skies, future yeah. or whatever. Okay. Yep, Sunless Skies, that is by Feel Better Games. And as Pavel says, it's just come out of early access. Absolutely delicious. Mm. Cool. Are any of the factions in this game uh, Cockneys? Yeah, you would know. Well, <laughs> you've got your stovepipes, which are these sort of. Um, we'll take esta- that as a yes. Establishment, <laughs> uh, uh, high tea drinking, uh, glove wearing. Um, Glo- glove wearing. <laughs> And you get what's called the Takitis, which are... Um, uh, they sound more like the Cockneys. Rebel, uh, free-thinking souls who want to uh, do, part do, with the, her, her renewed majesty. Do they ever, uh, at any point, roll out the barrel? <laughs> <laughs> or do they tell anybody to get out of my pub? <laughs> you, yes, if you side with the Takitis, which is what I do, uh, you, you do get uh, to encounter their sort of settlements more often. Ah, they they, they seem they, to be... Were they having a right old knees up? Right, right, right. Enough, Dave. <laughs> Enough. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> I've got games to talk about as well. <laughs> go, go for it, yeah. <laughs> right. Okay, well, let's uh, let's talk about what I've been doing. So uh, the other day there, I uh, closed the blinds, uh, got my helmet out and got a bit of the rhythm going. 
Ah, uh, that's the VR talk. Yeah, that's VR talk, aye. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's not what you were thinking, Dave. <laughs> yeah, so I've been playing Beat Saber, which is a game that a lot of people have been talking about. Um, it's been out for a wee while now. I don't think it's particularly new. I think it came out sometime last year. Um, Beat Saber is a rhythm game, um, and it's, well, it's called Beat Saber. You're using what look like lightsabers to basically play along with a beat. And the way it does it is that you have a red saber and a blue saber, the red saber in your left hand, the blue saber in your right hand, and you're putting this sort of weird, um, I don't know, so it's, there's almost something Tron-like about it in the way that it... Aesthetics, <laughs> The I suppose, aesthetic yeah. of it, yeah. There's some, it's kind of dark. I wonder if they um, have a, a license to use the lightsaber concept. Well, the thing is, I mean, the word saber, you can't really... Uh, I don't think you can really trademark that as such, because it does kind of mean like a sword, yeah, doesn't it? Yeah, but the it? saber is curved. Yeah, well, it's I don't know. I don't know. Let's not, like, let's not get bogged down in that. But essentially, all that's happening is that there's a song playing and there are uh, blocks coming towards you, and they're in various places around the screen. And Chris um, doesn't want his neighbours to see him playing this game. Well, this is why I close the blinds. <laughs> this is why I close the blinds. It's one of those few VR games. Usually when I play a VR game, I'm not really that bothered. But yeah, I did close the blinds for this one because it kind of makes you dance a bit. Um, I'm, I'm, I, I, don't, I don't dance. Yeah. I don't dance. It's, but this game kind of makes you dance. You were saying it's quite hard work as well. Oh, it's very hard work. I get very, very sweaty. Like so, there, I have to take so many breaks from playing this just to like cool down and, you know, clean the sweat off my brow and all that sort of stuff because you do get very hot playing this game. Um, but yeah, these blocks are coming towards you and there is an arrow on them and you have to slice those blocks in half and they are generally in time with the music. Um, and that is generally what the game is. Uh, the music is all very dancey. Um, there's some sort of drum and bass style stuff in there. There is a K-pop song in there, um, which is fucking nails. I've just not been able to complete it. Um <laughs> But the game has like two modes, essentially. It's got like a, a campaign mode and it's got a free play mode. In the free play mode, you can just pick any song on any difficulty and go for it. Um, this campaign mode has a story. The campaign mode does not have a story, oh, but it man. makes you play through songs. And there are a lot of levels in it by the looks of it, but you, you, you end up repeating the same songs. But they start throwing in different things to contend with. Um, so, for example, you might have to score a certain number of points in order to complete the level. And you get points just by, you know, comboing things. It's, it's got those usual rhythm game things where, like, if you start hitting lots of things in a row, your multiplier goes up. So you may have to score a certain number of points. You might have to not miss a certain number of notes. There is a weird one that I've discovered quite recently where uh, you, have to, you have to miss a certain number of notes, but also not miss a certain number of notes. So you have to try and get it right in the sweet spot. Wow. Which is a lot harder than it sounds. Yeah. <laughs> um, but there's also some, so you can put modifiers on it as well, and the campaign mode does this to you deliberately. And one of the worst things, and these are the levels I really struggle with, is the, the arrows only appear on the blocks for like a second, and then they disappear. And when you've got a lot of blocks coming towards you at once, it is so hard to remember where those arrows are in all of them. Holy and I've crap. failed so many of those levels so many times, and yeah, rage quit, basically. <laughs> Did you did you throw your monitor on the sorry your helmet on the floor or on the wall? <laughs> not, I've not slapped my helmet on the floor. No, this was a very passive aggressive rage quit, Chris. But yeah, I, I do. I did have to walk away from it for a while mm. and just be like, yeah, I'm I'm done with that. I mean, but that, like, that sounds really difficult. Oh yeah, I mean, I showed you a video of this before we started, and that and looked very difficult. Yeah, but it's pretty cool. Oh yeah, it yeah, is I mean, pretty it cool. Looks, it looks really nice, and uh, it does look like good exercise as well. It's pretty good exercise. It's mostly in the arms, though, as we said. You are just... Fl- I mean, <laughs> I don't want to think what I look like playing this. Have you seen some videos of people that try to make it look cool? And, you know, I'm just kind of like, oh, they can piss off, you know, <laughs> doing all their fancy moves and stuff. So that's me, I'm just went... standing there flailing my arms around wildly. Oh, my God. Now I understand, because when we were watching those videos, you were very cross with them. <laughs> so that's just... That's why. Okay. Look, these people think they're ninjas. All right, so it's not their fault. It's just you're you're being self conscious again. Oh yeah, I'm being very self. Can we film you next jealousy. time? Jealousy, jealousy is the word. I think we should just just it's going to be theoretic. We should film you next time and we should put it on YouTube. I'll tell you what, I'll film myself. Ah. I'll film myself playing this game just 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 to see how this how this goes. All right, just <laughs> just to prove a point. <laughs> I'm not going to do any ninja moves though. Oh man. <laughs> I do like tossing the lightsaber up in the air and catching it after it does a flip, though. That's that's quite satisfying. 
<laughs> it's a cool game, all right. It's it's quite fun. Um, must be, if you've got VR and you're into rhythm games, this is this is great. It's great fun. And it must be especially fun for a soundster. For a soundster, yes. I mean, I'm not really that into the kind of music that it plays, but at the same time, it's perfect for this kind of game. So even if you guys are mostly just guitar people and other sort of instruments, uh, as a as a cowbell person, I can say that you know <laughs> percussion uh, or drums is 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 a fun instrument to pretend to play on. Yeah, definitely. Hmm. The drums is always my instrument of choice when we played rock band and stuff. Rock band, that's the one we played on on the guitar controller, wasn't it? Yeah, but there's also a drum controller as well, Pat. Ah, right. <laughs> obviously, I knew that. <laughs> okay, anyway, that's that's really all I've got to say about Beat Saber. It's pretty cool. It's it's one of these sort of go to games that you can just like turn on, and you know, there's not a lot of these for VR, but. Um, it doesn't take a lot of like setting up or anything like that. It's just a case of you know start the game, pick a song, go. Does it benefit from VR as opposed to playing? A- well, it's pretty much the only way you can play it. Uh, sorry, what I mean is fair enough controllers, but uh, uh, the helmet. The helmet. Yeah. Well, yeah, definitely. All right. Mainly because like there are obstacles that come towards you, like walls and things like that. And you have to step out of the way of those, so you can you need the VR helmet. Oh, for that. okay, that makes sense now. And, and that's that can kind of make you start doing the sort of. St- <laughs> you know, that, you know that's, that that uh, that like primary school shuffle that you used to do, just the left left foot right foot, and out and out. Is, is that There's how a lot that going on. There's a lot of that going on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yes, Beat Saber. You can get it on Windows and PS4. It is by Beat Games. Uh, but actually, the game that I have put uh, two or three hours into now actually um, and it's a game, uh, one, another one of those Steam games that I bought when it was on sale and it sat there for a while and a lot of people like this game. This game's been really popular um, and it is Graveyard Keeper yeah. and it's kind of like a tongue-in-cheek version of these kind of like Animal Crossing games and uh, what's the one, the latest one? Like Harvest Moon or Harvest, Stardew yeah, Valley? Yeah, Harvest Moon and yeah, Stardew Valley would probably be the closest one. Mm-hmm. It's got that same sort of 16-bit style uh, graphics and that sort of top-down look to it. Uh, the The story of the game, it's like the introduction to the game is almost like a sort of visual novel style thing where you're just seeing some guy who like goes to the shop in the modern world um, and comes out and he's looking at his phone and his text message and he's te- texting his, uh, his beautiful other half and saying, you know, I'll be home soon or whatever, and then he gets hit by a car. Aww. And then you wake up and you're in this 16-bit world um, controlling this guy and there's a there's a skull <laughs> that you go and dig up, and he starts talking to you. And he basically like tells you that you're the graveyard keeper now, um, and everybody's genuinely confused. All the sort of NPCs that you meet in this game are a bit confused about you talking about the real world, uh, where your which your character often does, and he keeps saying to people, "I need to get home. I need to go and see my other half. You know, I need mm. to get back to her." Um, and people are just like, "Don't know what you're talking about, mate." Except the skull who seems to be letting on that he knows something. Um, but he wants beer in order to talk. The skull's an alcoholic. Um, so, you know, you have to acquire beer in order to get you him know, to talk. Talking skulls are never trustworthy. Oh, no, games. they're not. It's like a kind of trope, isn't it? Or talking dismembered heads. They always have a secret. There's always yeah, something yeah, yeah. they're keeping from you. Well, I never thought of that. <laughs> How was Hamlet's skull? Yeah, but I didn't talk to him, though. He talked to it. Well, funny you should mention that. <laughs> there is there is a ghost in this game called Yorick. Ooh. <laughs> there you go. Who I've only met once, and he asked me to do something, and I can't remember what it was. <laughs> That's I think he wanted me to dig a body up and remove it from the graveyard, but I can't remember why. Um, <laughs> anyway, so basically what's happening in this is that you're the graveyard keeper, and there's a graveyard uh, that is right next to the little house that you now live in. Um, and the bishop guy turns up on the first day that you're there, and he just tells you, okay, you're now the graveyard keeper. If you want promoted, you're going to have to tidy this graveyard up, because it's a mess. And he's right, the graveyard is a mess. All the sort of, like, stones and everything are all broken. Um, You know, the little fence areas that you can put round graves, you know, there's some of those in there, and they're all falling to pieces and stuff like that. So you're just like, okay... When you go into the graveyard, in the top right of the screen, it tells you what the quality of your graveyard is. It's a numerical value, and it's negative. Oh. So you've got to tidy this place up. Can I just ask, how, when you get promoted, once you finally get promoted, what, uh-huh. what, what, what do gravekeepers become when they get promoted? Well, I did get promoted, and it became a prior, I think. Oh. But I'll get to that. I'll okay. get to that. So the other thing that happens, though, is that a donkey turns up with a cart. And you go up to this donkey and talk to him, and uh, he starts giving you a lot of communist chat. 
Oh. Oh, so you, you, there's a communist donkey. No, no, that's that that suddenly makes more sense. <laughs> Um, he keeps calling you comrade, blah blah blah, um, but he drops off bodies, so he brings bodies to you, and then you've got a little morgue that you can take this body into, and then you can cut it up, and you know you take some meat out, and you can cook that meat later and eat it. It's good because because quite a lot of uh, <laughs> but the skull keepers are cannibals. Why? The skull like lives in the morgue now, so he's just like telling you, okay, yeah, cut this body up, take the meat out, and then you can go and bury it. So off you go and you go and bury it. You dig, have to dig a new hole, but then, you know, that grave gives you a negative quality because there's nothing on it. So you've got to go and, like, start making tombstones and doing all the doing all the undertakery stuff if you want to get your graveyard up to up to scratch. Um, so, so this this game does have a pretty heavy crafting element to it. Um, there's a lot of things that you can make in it, and there's lots of various little blueprint tables that you have to go to in order to make certain things. Um, it's one of those kind of games, um, and you know you have to make like stone cutters tables, and you've got to make a little saw thing, and you've got to do you can make a forge, and you know do the crafty things that quite a lot of crafting games have. But there's a pretty cool like uh, sort of tree thing where you can unlock the different recipes in. Um, but it uses three different types of currency essentially and you only get those from doing various tasks so there are three there's there's a red a green and a blue the red ones for like doing handcraft and physical labor um so the more of that you do the more of the red resource that you'll get um if you do like chopping down trees doing any sort of naturey style things you'll get the green resource um and the blue one is spiritual i've never received any of that yet <laughs> um but a lot of the stuff at the beginning of the skill tree just needs the red and green right. resources so essentially you're just like going through doing various tasks and unlocking new things so that you can then go and tidy up your graveyard there is also a village nearby and you can go to that and there are like various npcs there's a tavern in there every time you bury a body you magically get a burial certificate thing and you can go to the tavern and you can trade that certificate in for money and then you can go and yeah i don't know i don't know what's going on there but that's apparently it's an ancient uh, agreement with the town and the gravekeepers or whatever that this is what happens that the tavern the guy that runs the tavern is also the head of the village and he has to give you the money for it you don't get a lot of money for it it's a very small amount but you can go and spend your money you can buy like food off the tavern keeper but you, there's a blacksmith in town and he's been really useful because of something he's needed nails and i can't really make nails yet so just go and buy them off of him and that means that i can go and make some uh some coffins. little things to improve my graveyard. Hmm. Um, don't you don't need coffins apart? I don't know if coffins are going to come later, but you just kind of throw the bodies in the ground <laughs> at the moment. They're just what they're wrapped a up. shoddy graveyard! <laughs> oh my! I'm, you know what? I'm not surprised anymore that yours is negative. <laughs> Jesus! But just like in like games like Stardew Valley, and that it's like you do get a lot of tasks from people. Like people will just say, "Oh, I want this thing. I want that thing," and they generally they're offering to help you with something. They might give you a new recipe for something like or something like that. You know, go and bring me five of these things. You know, it's those kind of tasks. And at first I thought, "There's no quest log. What's going on?" But it turns out there's an NPC page in your uh, menu, and it lists underneath each NPC what they want you to do. So that's actually really useful. Um, I only just discovered that this afternoon. Actually, I met uh the Inquisitor. There's a Holy Inquisition going on. Oh, excellent. He wants me to join the Inquisition. He made me go and watch a witch being burnt. He made me. I had no choice in the matter. I said no, and he went, nah, come on. <laughs> <laughs> and then he says to me, oh, you can join the Inquisition. And I was just like, yeah, why not? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah. You're just kind of wandering about, meeting random NPCs. Um, there's an alchemist or something. No, no, sorry, an astrologer somewhere. Um, I haven't found him yet, but apparently he talks to the lighthouse keeper on a certain day, so I have to go there on a certain day. The days are represented by weird symbols. They're not given names. They're just little symbols on a dial at the top of the screen uh -huh. that kind of spins round and says what day it is. And when you go to the NPC screen to see what tasks you've got, if they're associated with certain days, they'll have the symbol next that you can only do this on this day or whatever. Um, so I haven't uh, gone and met the astrologer yet, but I think he might have some answers for me. But yeah, it's it's a weird game. It's just wacky. Like, it's just a wacky take on these kind of Stardew Valley farming games. I mean, you can set up a farm in this and just start growing crops. There's so much stuff that you can do. So why, why Graveyard Keeper? Why this? I mean, apart from the, like, comical value. I think it's just that. I think it is just somebody went, I wonder what it's like to make a game where you're a Graveyard Keeper. And that's and what they've done. But they've just made it, and they've that. made it so much like a sort of... Stardew Valley-esque game hmm. 
that it basically is one of those, but just with this wacky idea. Um, and then Pavel, just to answer your question, the bishop guy, when I when he promoted me, when I did get my graveyard up to scratch, and I spent, so that was what I focused my efforts on. And I think that's one of the things about this game, is that you can just do what you want when you want. So I could have just ignored the graveyard if I wanted to, and just gone and done other things if I wanted to. Um, but he, he promoted me, and that was when the church in the graveyard then opened, because he was like, okay, the church is yours now. But you have to come here on this day every week and give a sermon. And he said, okay, give your first sermon. So I gave a sermon. Nobody was there to listen to it. But uh, I did my sermon and I gained three faith. Wow. And that was just an item that went into my inventory. <laughs> <laughs> Which is weird. So now I've got three faith that I don't know what to do with. But fair enough. Um, but the church itself, when you go inside the church, you can spruce the church up. And I think the more you spruce it up, the more people will come and listen to your sermons and the more faith you'll get. That sounds so, suspiciously like an actual religion. Well, like, yeah, well, there you go. But, um, <laughs> but uh, the, like I say, there's just there's a few different things going on. So you can do what you want. You can go and do some farming. You can go and just keep your graveyard up to scratch. You can uh, part of the like the, the tree thing, the tech the tech tree thing, is to like research different ways of cutting up the bodies or different materials you can extract from them. So I can now extract the blood from them, for example. Um, and I also took the other one that's let me take their skulls and their bones. Oh, excellent. So, and then I'm assuming that these are going to then have some crafting value, or I can sell them, or something like that. So, ah. I, there, there's a lot of different resources in the game, a lot of different items, a lot of, there's a few things going on, and I, and I quite like it. There is also combat in it. Oh. You're given a rusty sword by the blacksmith and told to go and deal with some slimes. Classic enemy, right. by the way. Um, I also killed some bats that were hanging about near my house, uh, and got some bat wings off of them. Presumably I can cook and eat those. Uh, so yeah, Wacky, weird, but sounds like a compelling lot of game, at the same time because the whole way through everything that happens, your little character is constantly saying to people, "I don't belong in this world. I don't know why I'm a graveyard keeper. I don't know what's going on. I need to get home in my life." <laughs> and the whole way through it is that's pretty much all he's obsessing over. Can't blame him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But he just kind of like he's he's just accepting that he's along for the ride, so he's just going to do what he's doing. But he keeps thinking it's a dream. So, we'll see where this game goes. Um, I am compelled to play more of it. Because it does have crafting in it, and I do like crafting. And I do like when I have a lot of options with crafting. Um, I know that can get out of hand sometimes, and sometimes it's just very samey. But it, it seems that there's quite a lot of options, and I want to see where they go. Um, what, what extent I can take it to. I know that you can create a crematorium at some point. Uh, right. And I don't know what sort of effect that has on your graveyard but I, don't, I, don't, I was wondering the graveyard itself has limited space in it so are there zombies? I have not seen any zombies yet <laughs> but let's just assume that there probably will be just keep because it seems ideas. that kind of game yeah. they'll probably be friendly zombies known in this game <laughs> Okay. you'll probably just have to bring brains to them because you can extract their brains eventually from the bodies Aye. I'm just guessing so <laughs> this, this is our zombie theory so far that <laughs> You can extract the brains from a body and maybe take them as zombies. Let's see if that happens. Let's see if that happens. Is the actual graveyard management bit of it fun? Like, it's, is it like, it's how much fun. flexibility is it in terms of like making a, a nice looking graveyard? At the moment, there's not a lot of flexibility, but it's totally affected by what you are able to create. Because you can make wooden tombstones, you can make wooden fence areas, you can make stone ones. Mm -hmm. Those will add, like the stone ones, add more quality to your graveyard. But also, if you go to the blueprint thing in your graveyard itself, you can create flower beds and that kind of thing. So I think there is a wee bit of options there, and presumably more stuff will unlock mm -hmm. because this is a game where things unlock. So I mean, just talking to people can sometimes unlock certain things. Um, quite a lot of the things that I've unlocked are just through speaking to the NPCs essentially. Um, so we'll see where it goes, but I mean, it is because th this this is like where it becomes like the sort of farming games like Stardew Valley and stuff like that. There's a lot of sort of grindy things to do, uh, where you are essentially, you have an energy bar and you have to go and sleep to get your energy bar back like yeah. you do in Stardew Valley. Um, but just going and doing some of the tasks around the graveyard will deplete that energy bar. Um, one of the good things about this, though, is that in Stardew Valley, I believe that you pretty much had to go to sleep at night all the time. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I might, I might be wrong about that. But in this, it's a bit. It's really flexible 
in terms of like you can just work through the night if you've got the energy to do it and you can just keep eating food to get your energy back and just keep doing what you want to do um so i, I it's, it's not as strict i would say as these other farming games are in that sort of sense hmm. um but definitely a wee bit of grindness. There's a lot of walking back and forward as well. The town isn't exactly nearby your house. It takes maybe about a minute to walk there and then come back again. Yeah, it's just the way these games are, though. It's yeah, definitely. Part yeah. of their charm, uh, I think. So there it is. Graveyard Keeper. Um, I'm going to keep playing this and I'll report back on uh, what weird and wonderful shit happens in it and how I got on with Yorick. Um <laughs> That is by Lazy Bear Games. Its initial release date is 15th of August 2018. Uh, you can get that on Xbox One, apparently, uh, and Microsoft Windows and Linux. Oh, the creators of that game, yeah, I just noticed this, actually. Uh, they made Punch Club, I believe, which is a mobile game that I played, which was actually quite fun, because it was basically just like a fight club game. Uh, where you have to train up your fighter by ah, doing various okay. things, and it was it was reasonably fun for a while. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that is episode one hundred and eight. Hooray! Hooray! Hooray. <laughs> um, we will give out all our internet stuff. Our email address is firstplayertoken at gmail dot com. That's f i r s t player token. Uh, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube. We have a PSN community. You can find us on Discord. That's discord.ime slash firstplayertoken. You can also find us on Twitch. Our website will be back up and running in a few weeks. Um, all of our social media stuff is either FIRST player token or 1ST player token. Once player token. Thank you very much, David. And we are part of the Podnos Network. The UK's leading entertainment podcast network. So you can go to podnos.com and check out their website to see what... Uh, new episodes of the various podcasts that are on there of various topics. Yeah. But there's a big archive if you want to go and delve into that. Okay, we will be back next week. Um, pretty sure that'll definitely be a board games episode. We have been playing a lot of board games recently, and I'm kind of happy to say that. Uh, may even be space for RPGs, Pavel. Oh my god! May even be space. I'm so happy. Uh, if you turn up. <laughs> are you just baiting me, yes? <laughs> okay, then. But until then, thanks for listening. Bye. Bye. Bye.